Well, we've been looking at God's plan for the church. If you'll turn to Titus chapter 3, where he, Paul has instructed him to put all things in order so that they will be the light that they have been called to be in Titus 2.10, so that we will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. And the way we're going to do that is in chapter 1, appoint elders who will teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. In Titus 2, we need a church of discipleship where we're all pouring into each other's lives, older women to younger women, older men to younger men. In Titus 3 now, we see that the church then must be devoted to good deeds in the world. We're to engage it with the humility and the truth of Jesus Christ. We're to now permeate this world with this gospel and truth. Titus 3.1, remind them. Remind them, Titus. And the outline is, Paul wants Titus then to remind the church in Crete about four things in regards to your impact in the world. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 2. Remind them of their calling. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Remind them to permeate this world in a peaceable way in submission to God, authorities that we learned this morning in Sunday school. Um, secondly, remind them then of their condition. We'll look at it in verse 3. Verses 4 through 7, remind them then of their conversion. And in verse 8, remind them of their commission is what we will look at together this morning. So let's take up that second point. Remind them of their condition. Look with me in verse 3. <clears throat> For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful in hating one another. Before getting angry at your president, governing officials, police, legislation, before getting angry at liberals, before reaching for hate and condescension and ridicule and mockery and avoidance and bitterness, try to humiliate them with your arguments uh, or just maybe just be angry at them as we've seen in the, the days last, last week. Paul says, did you forget something really important? Who you were before God saved you? Have you forgotten what John Newton wrote about a saving grace, this amazing grace that saved a wretch like me? Isaiah saw God and says, woe is me for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. Peter saw Jesus Christ and he said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. I think sometimes we forget where we have come from. As we look out at a world that's acting out its nature, loving sex, perverting it, changing God's design of everything right now, killing babies and the sickness of it, the anger and murderous spirits, this is what people do who do not know God. Ephesians 4.17 this I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. They, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness." This is what I spent the first 20 years of my life doing. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? Listen to Paul's list this morning that he wants you to remember in verse 3. Have you forgotten that once you yourselves were foolish? We were ignorant. The fool says in his heart there is no God. And we lived as if God didn't exist. We were darkened in our understanding we, we were moranos, we were moronic, we, we were foolish, and we couldn't think. Our, our minds were darkened in our understanding. That's how we were apart from Christ. You were disobedient. We would not respond to the truth. We were like sheep, and each of us went our own way. We were guided by our passions and not the truth of God's word. We just disobeyed it, and we gave hearty approval to those who did the same, according to Romans 1. Paul says, thirdly, you were deceived. This word means deception, or it really it carries the idea of not being anchored. 
You're, you're, you weren't anchored to, to God and to truth. And so you would just wander and be led astray by the most foolish things. I was a young boy and I heard a song. It, it said, I, I like to believe that God is love. He's down below. He's up above. Uh, he knows who cares and doesn't care. And he doesn't associate with just those who congregate. So it was just kind of this theme as if you're a good guy, God knows it and he loves you. And I was like, that's it. That's my world religion. And I, I was just so deceived thinking that that's it. Just I, I couldn't morally discern through that at all. I didn't know how blind I was. I thought I was so smart. I had the whole God thing wired from a song by Don Williams. I went to church every Sunday and I was walking off a plank into the eternal abyss, deceived that I was okay. And I couldn't pull out of it. I, I could not find truth for myself. I was deceived. Just like this world that we look at right now, have you forgotten that that's what you lived in as well? Paul says you were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Epithumia, we've gone over that word quite a bit. Thumia is desire, epi is over. So it's this desire for it could be even good things, but it's an over-desire. I desire it over God. And so we lived in this world with just these epithumias that we, we, we loved and we wanted at any cost. That's how we lived. We wanted money, sex, food, alcohol, power, approval. It just every, it drove everything that we were. I look at these teenagers, and they're just driven by epithumias. The, the whole culture is built around epithumias. That is the marketing. That is what drives this world. It can be politics, changing a culture. There's a million different epithumias, but Paul says this is how you all lived. These over-desires drove your life. It's what controlled you. It had every bit of the core of your being. That's what you were in Adam. Fifthly, Paul says you were spending your life then in malice and envy. Malice means deep wickedness or maliciousness. You were malicious towards others and you envied them. That means ill will or wanting others' happiness. I could never see anyone else have better gifts, uh, be more beautiful, have more accomplishments, more power, smarter, and I could never look at it without desiring for me and hating them because they have it. It was just this empty satisfaction in your heart that you could never fill. So everything, just emptiness, emptiness, I can't fill my heart in Adam. You hate everyone else because you're miserable. Even more if they have something that you don't. I think that's a picture of America in a nutshell. Do you remember this? That's where you lived. And Paul says you were hateful and you were hating one another. You hate anyone in the way. If a Christian told you God hates what you're doing, you hated him. Anyone who gets in the way of you getting what you want, you hate them. Anyone who gets what you want, you hate them. You just lived hating anyone that crossed you or got in your way or told you something that you didn't like. That is what we were apart from Christ. That is the way that we all are born into this world with self at the center as we come in Slaves to lust, the devil, and this world. They're tied by those three cables. We hate like our father, the devil. That's the picture of what we were. Not one of you want to put on uh, uh, that mantle on, uh, uh, on the shelf. Uh, you don't want to take a selfie and post that on Facebook, do you? Look, this, is what, this is who I am. And Paul says, this is what you were. Have you forgotten what you were. You can tell yourself what a good guy you are until the cows come home. You can hire a psychiatrist, pay him or her money to tell you how good you really are. You can listen to motivational speakers. You can listen to Joel Olstein tell you. You can, do, you can just keep pumping yourself up. I'm good. I'm good. But at the end of the day, this is what the creator of the universe and the creator of every heart says about you. The all-knowing one says this about your heart this morning when you were outside of Christ. If a believer, you nod and say amen. That's just a fraction of the real picture that you just described, Pastor. It's, it's way worse than what you just said. And if you're an unbeliever, you're, you're going to fight with all of your heart what I just said. You're fighting right now saying that, that isn't me. Who is this guy? You won't admit it. 
What is your response to what I just said? It's going to show you the state of your soul this morning, whether you've been redeemed or whether you're still in Adam. That's a, that is an x-ray of my heart. Thank you. That's a picture of me. I, I, I walked in that. I lived in that. That testimonies this morning were beautiful. They lived in that. And then have you forgotten that that was your mugshot? Can you look at a world in the condition that it's in right now and do you hate it? Do you ridicule it? Do you fight it? Do you slander it? Do you condemn it? And do you, I hear this the most often. How can they do that? How can they not do that? The answer to Paul is never forget the place that you came from. And what I've seen in my life and watching others is those who are really making an impact for the kingdom of God and evangelism, they're not the smart ones who can logic you under the table, destroy every argument that you bring up, but they're these sweet little humble children of God who have seen this portrait and cannot get over the grace of God. They've been wrecked by it. And therefore, when they enter into the world, the people that they're sharing with, they know that they're not lording it over them or thinking that they're better, but they feel with Paul as they share the gospel, I'm the greatest of sinners. I'm the greatest of sinners. And when you enter into the world that way, I'm telling you, you'll see way more fruit than this condescending, high horse Christian who just looks down on everybody. Paul's just saying, here's why we're not entering society the right way. Have you forgotten what you were? This is why you are condescending and so angry at believers all of the time, fighting and getting in arguments with them all the time because you've forgotten or you never knew, which would make you a Pharisee. And you'll, you'll look at a harlot washing Jesus' feet with her tear, tears in her hair, and you'll say, doesn't he know what kind of woman it is that's touching him? And we'll look at the world with filth and disgust if we haven't come to see our mugshot in Titus 3.3 3 and say, that was me. That was me without a doubt. Well, <clears throat> here's the amazing part to me. As bad as this was, it's just a whole world filled with this stuff, hating and hating one another, that there's this verse that is held up at football games all the time, but I just, I think it's been abused, but it, it's so treasured in my heart that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is an amazing, amazing truth that should take your breath away. Um, there's a lot of debate when you hear that. For God so loved the world, and is this the world of elect? Is this just the whole world of everybody? And it goes back and forth. But John's use of world is interesting. He, he more uses the world to show the use of the, the badness of it. Uh, it isn't even showing the size of it. It's, it's emphasizing that he so loved the world and all of its badness. And all of Titus 3.3 3, circling the whole world. This is an amazing statement that God loved us, the world and all of its badness and foulness. And Titus 3.3, 3, that he loved it, that he would send his son into that to bring about salvation. That's the part you should never be able to get over. And so there's something else that I want you to remember this morning as well. And in verses 4 through 7, I want you to, to remember your conversion. So I want you to remember your condition that you lived in and walked in. But now what, what I heard this morning got me so excited. R remember your conversion. What, what I love about all of Paul's lists or pictures of what we were. In Romans 3, he spends three chapters showing you what you were. And he gets at the end, there's, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none good. There's none who seek after God. And he just says, everybody's under the dominion of sin. And he just kind of leaves you there dead. You're, just, you're dead before God. His wrath is on you. You're, you just got no hope in anything in yourself to fix this. That's your condition. Dead, stuck. Nature's corrupt. You can't fix it. And then all of a sudden, but now... In Romans 3.21, there is something that God has done. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were, by nature, you were slaves to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Here you are again, dead, dead, slaves to that, but God being rich in mercy, in which He loved us. When you were dead, He made you alive together with Christ. And now in Titus 
3, 3, you're dead. You are foolish and hating and hateful with one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Here's the rescue and the remedy for your condition. And Paul's saying, Titus, teach them, never get over how dead you were and that God saved you. There's one main sentence in Titus 3, 4 through 7. The rest are modifiers. And I love this one sentence. I spent much time meditating in exaltation this week over this one little sentence. It has the whole Bible in it. If you'll look in verse 5, He saved us. Main, main sentence, main verb, He saved us. The only reason we are still not like Titus 3.3 3, under the dominion of sin and hating and hating everything around us, it's not because of us. It is because of Almighty God. We are not smug and judgmental and critical. We differ because of the grace of God alone. He saved us. Have you forgotten this? Are you repulsed by the gay and the lesbian? Are you repulsed by the transgender? Are you repulsed by the leaders in this country with depraved heart and mind? Are you repulsed by the rich who have a thousand times more than you and they snub you? Are you repulsed at the elite of society or by evolutionists? Are you repulsed at the drug addict holding a sign will work for food? Are you repulsed at it? Or do you look at it like Jesus Christ who wept over the city of Jerusalem? Do you see their need for a great Savior? I'm just afraid the church is just, all we're after is a conservative agenda and looking at people and judging them. If they just learned a a conservative agenda, this world would be fixed. Stop. They need to be saved. Do you marvel that you had nothing in you to turn the heart of God towards you, only away from you, but by free, sovereign grace alone, He saved us. He saved us. Salvation starts and it originates with God. He is the rescuer and not we ourselves. The only reason you are different from this corrupt society around us, the only reason is because He saved us. He saved us from sin. It's penalty. It's power and one day it's very presence. And he saved us from its consequences, which is the wrath of God for all of eternity upon us. He saved us from sin. He saved us from God. Jesus came to save us from God. He saved us to a life. He saved us from that. And he saved us to a life of eternal fellowship and communion with him forever. That's what should overwhelm your hearts this morning. He saved us. He saved us, and that's what the rest of these verses describe, and I'm going to do a flyover, but just enjoy the view. Sometimes I, I enjoy flying on a plane versus driving in a car, and I just, let's, we're going to fly over these and just enjoy the view. Uh, pretend like it's night and all the lights are on, and you're just getting to see something beautiful. Look with me in Titus 2, <clears throat> even back to 2.11 is, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. And so now in verse 4, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, the kindness of God caused God to effect a saving plan. It caused Him to accomplish it and to bring it to pass. This word really means the goodness of heart. Because of the goodness and the kindness in God's heart, Uh, He has concern toward people in need. And in verse 3 are a bunch of people in need. I was in need, in a great need. And God is kind. How blessed we are that God is kind. It's His attribute. A very character and nature and essence of God is that He is kind. And it appeared. His kindness came. Listen to Luke 6. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good and lend. Expect nothing in return and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Go show kindness, and you will be like your God who is kind to ungrateful 
and people on a daily basis who are evil against him. This is innate to who God is. Romans 2, 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? His kindness has appeared. The kindness of God should lead us to repentance, that he is being patient and gathering in his people in these days. Romans 11, behold then the kindness and the severity of God, the way he's dealt with Jews and Gentiles, his kindness to those who fell severity, but to you Gentiles, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will be cut off like the Jews. This attribute is that God is kind, moves him to save us. And so I want you just to see this morning that there's a God who has a kindness to him. And I live in that every day. Don't ever get over the kindness of our God who has uh, caused grace to appear, his son to come and enter into this world to bring about salvation. Look with me in verse 4. The second part of God is his love for mankind appeared. So his kindness appeared in the Savior and his love for mankind appeared. It's interesting, this word for love, it's not agape, but it's philanthropia, which is where we get the word philanthropic. And it carries the idea of mercy, compassion, or pity. It, it means strong affection to relieve the stress of another. This strong, deep affection. I want to relieve someone in distress. And so God looks at the condition of Titus 3, 3, and, and he feels this love. And so this love is not just an emotion. It's an emotion, it says, that reaches out in pity and compassion. So because God is philanthropic, he sees us in our need and it reached out to solve it, to love it, to bring it to himself. So it, it, it's a love that brings you to act for the relief of those who are in need. So we see it probably the best in the prodigal son when he decides, I don't want my father. I, I think life is away from the father. And so he gets his inheritance and he goes and he spends it on, in, on, on just wanton living, riotous living, and he ends up eating the pig slop. And he comes back uh, and he, it says he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for this Titus 3.3 3 soul. And he ran and he embraced him, and he kissed him, and he put the ring on his finger, and he killed the fattened calf and said, let's have a party. My son, who was dead, has returned. The, the, he saw him at a distance, and he did what a, a man never did in that age, and he lifted his skirt, and he ran to him. He runs to him, and the kindness of God, he comes to us and, and, and embraces and, and receives in such a beautiful way. So his grace... His kindness and his love have been personified, as I said a few weeks back, by the appearing of Jesus Christ. How do I see his grace, his kindness, and his love? I see it in the person that was incarnated into this world, the Son of God. And so let the appearing of Christ preach to your souls this morning. If you're struggling with this principle, how do I know God is gracious and kind and loving? It's not by looking at every providence through the human eye, but it's to look at Jesus Christ. And you, you, you settle this once and for all in Christ. When I look at him, my God is gracious and kind and loving that he would send his son for me in that condition when I couldn't do anything to fix it or get out of it and all the consequences of my sin. He came. And here's an important one in verse 5. He saved us then, not on the basis of deeds which were done in righteousness. He saved us. This is really an amazing statement. And I believe the church is filled with people who don't get this one statement or believe it. And I, I know there's some sitting here this morning that don't really understand this statement. When we realize there's a holy God and that we are sinful, and what separates us is not a crack in the sidewalk, but the Grand Canyon. We go to fix it. And you realize, i got to fix this. I'm in trouble. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to help old ladies with their groceries at the store. I'm going to fix it by deeds done in righteousness. I'm going to find a way. 
I got to fix this problem. I'm in bad shape. Many people come to church with that mindset. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be better. I'm going to quit sinning. And this was the Pharisees' whole system. This was their whole system of religion to get right with God by their works of righteousness. And this is many today in church with the same system. This is the hallmark of fundamentalism. This was the foundation of Bill Gothard's whole system. It's what the natural man will always look to. It's alive and well in the hearts of people sitting here this morning. Still looking to their own merits, their own works, their own hands to get right with this God. You learn this in church, and they come and they give you a system of what you're supposed to do. Here's the list. Do these things, and and you're going to be a good Christian. Go prayer. Here's your Bible study. Here's the service you serve in the church in this way. Here's your community works. Here's your evangelism. Here's your mission trips. Here's your tithing. Here's the men's breakfast. You just you get your list of everything that you're supposed to do, and all of a sudden, this is how I get righteous. If I do all of these things, God's going to love me. He's finally going to be happy with me. He'll be merciful to me. He'll be kind to me, and he'll be gracious to me. And the gospel is that you got to die to that. That is not how you get saved. You need to repent of your sins. And you need to repent of your righteousness. I've been preaching this forever. Repent of sin. And repent of your righteousness, thinking that there's anything you can do to get right with God. You're going to work up your very best, come smiling, going, look at this God. And he says you're going to be holding a pile of manure. And Isaiah, a filthy rag. That's all you're going to have when you see who God really is. And so repent of thinking there's anything in good in you and that God is favorable because of who you are. Turn from that. He says, not on, on the deeds which we have done, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Both are trying to hide from God. I flee to sin to hide from God, and I flee to my righteousness to hide from really dealing with God. There's a gospel that is centered on one person, one person only. And in verse 4, it's that when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, it is in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, a, a, it was a awful. I'm sorry, I lost myself. There's a gospel centered on one person, Christ. Look to Him alone as a Savior. He's, he's personified grace, kindness, and mercy, and love. It's all in this one person. It's not my righteousness working that up to get it. It's me looking in Titus 3.3 and finally dying because there's nothing righteous in me. And I'm going to look only to this one. And in him is grace and love and kindness and mercy. There's nothing in me. I look to this one and this one alone. And people sit in church Sunday after Sunday looking at Jesus with all of their own righteousness. Here it is. Here's where you find mercy and grace and life and peace in him. Look your eyes out. Look your eyes out at a God who would be merciful and kind and compassionate and to take you and wash you and cleanse you and forgive you. He'll give you, it says in verse 5, he did it according to his mercy. It's mercy alone that you will ever be saved. Mercy is different than grace. Mercy deals with the heart of God as he looks at the miserable condition that we were in. He had had mercy on us, guys. He cares about the wretched state that we were in in verse 3. It was a miserable, awful place to be, but God had mercy, and in verse 5, he saved us. He saved us. I want you to listen to Paul's testimony of this. Philippians 3, he said, I might myself have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, you want to start bragging about having righteousness? I got far more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. And as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But... Whatever things were gained to me, the things that I thought were earning God's favor and his approval, those things that were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss, manure, 
They're now manure. Everything I was smiling, thinking was going to get God's favor, it's all manure. I count it loss, and it isn't even even. Those things were loss. They were leading me away from God. They weren't even neutral. All your little self-righteousness is leading you away from God. And he says, I count them but loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be loss. Everything else leads me away. It's, it's minus. Everything is loss. In view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count everything I lost as rubbish for the purpose that I might gain Christ. And I might be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law apart from righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So here's all I care about, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. It's mercy alone that we look to. None of our own hands and our own works and our own righteousness. Look, look this morning. There's some of you that need to look and see this. Look with me in verse 5. The next flyby is he says he did it by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And this is the one I would like to spend three months on. <clears throat> Work with me here for a second. <clears throat> this is probably the most rejected term in our culture. Uh, regeneration. Being born again or being saved. Our country loves morality. We love to talk about God, higher powers, change, ministry to the needy, society, therapy. We love all of those things. You mention Jesus and it changes the tone. You mention born again and it's over. They're not going to even talk anymore. What is that? Come on, you're... you're you're an you're a adult who can think. What's this born-again stuff? They hate it. Yet this is the key to the whole saving mission of Jesus. And so I know I'm doing a flyover, but I want to do a flyover of the flyover. I want to I go global, and then I want to come back to your personal salvation. The word for regeneration, you know how many times this word appears in the Bible? Yell it out if you know it. Twice. Twice. It's only used twice in the Bible, though it's talked about in a hundred different sections. It was promised in Ezekiel and Jeremiah as the new covenant. It's all over the scriptures, but this word is only used twice. And the Greek word is palingenesis, regenesis. It's a beautiful word. But let, let's look first at the other place where it's used, and it's in Matthew. And I'm going to read it to you in 1928. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, in the palingenesis, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so this word, this term used there is that, that culmination of all things, the renewal of the whole universe by fire when everything is made new. Palingenesis is this great renewal. And it's what the whole world is waiting for where God is going to come and make all things new and He's going to renew this whole earth. A new heavens and a new earth is going to happen at the regeneration. And so Jesus calls it the climax of the Christian hope. The new heavens and the new earth, the place when the universe is regenerated, there's a day described in Revelation at this regenesis where everything broken and everything sad from this fall will be made new. And there'll be this purging by fire. All brokenness will be, be mended. Isn't that a great promise? All we know is brokenness. And it's going to all be mended. Uh, Trump can't do that. I just had to throw that out there. Only Jesus can do this. This is our hope. And it's going to be fully satisfied on that regenesis at the last day. Guys, this is the blessed hope of the believer. I pray it's your blessed hope this morning. The presence of the true king will come to earth and everything is going to blossom in his healing hands. Everything in the universe is going to sing and dance. Everything will be what it was supposed to be. 
And everything sad and broken and evil and hurtful will be fixed at the regeneration. Romans 8 says creation is groaning for this, and so are we within ourselves. We're we're longing for this. But now at the time left, consider the other use of this word. Isn't that big and beautiful? But there's one other use that all of a sudden comes and gets real close to home. It narrows, and it gets really personal. He says, you're you're to have a palingenesis. The Holy Spirit pours out a regenesis on you where he makes you new and he gives you a new birth. And if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has come, the old is gone, the new has come. The healing power of the king that's going to come at the end that I just described comes to you right now as a down payment of that day that's going to that comes into us by the Spirit of God. So that is what happens in a believer. And so I want you to hear this. Listen. The gospel is not just, I have inner peace now. I'm not going to go to hell, but I'm going to go to heaven. I've got help now to reach the goals that I've always wanted to accomplish. But it is God's healing kingdom power that comes into your life now by the Holy Spirit of God. And he says in this verse, it's poured out on us rich, richly. The Spirit of God is poured out on us richly. The power of that end day is now put within us. And so some of the healing he gives to you right now. And then at the regenesis, it's going on right now in, in your heart and in my heart. God is renewing it by his power and making all things new within us. So if you're a Christian, there is a thorough newness to your life. Today, I just hear, I just need Jesus because my life is broken. I need Jesus because I'm sad. I need Jesus because I feel guilt. I need more purpose in my life. Jesus can help me. And the truth is, from this verse, you have no idea how much more it is than that. You have the power of the King. That's going to renew everything in the universe within you this morning. He is going to change everything about you from one image of glory to the next. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. That power is within us, changing us and conforming us to the image of Christ. Paul prayed to the Ephesians, I wish you knew the power that was available to you. I wish you knew the palingenesis that has taken place within you and what you really have and what power there is to draw upon. Don't underestimate the power of the new birth. No matter what is wrong with you, hear this, you can overcome it by the power within us as we draw from it. I don't want you sitting here saying, I'm always going to be this way. There is a palingenesis within you that can overcome the deepest nature sins problems and darkness Christian life is a it is an optimistic thing there is a power I want you to see this morning I want you to listen to Titus 2 14 he gave himself for us so he says looking for the blessed hope in verse 13 we have Jesus he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are going to be zealous for good deeds. That Greek word for purify is catharsis. To to purify, to cleanse a, a people, a church, a community. So now what he's saying, guys, is we are to show the world what the kingdom of God will look like at that at that last day that I'm describing. So now that he's come into our life with his spirit, he's saying, now you as a community you get to show the world what's coming on the last day. We're we're showing them the power of God and what it does in a mirror dimly right now in our lives. So this isn't just a happier you. You are brought into a new community with the power of God within to live a whole new way that we've been seeing in Titus. That there's a power to live these lives of Titus 2 that we saw where lives are pouring in and building and teaching each other how to live the life of God and Christ in this world. And so to change your identity, it changes your desires, your hopes, your goals, your dreams, 
your pursuits, this, this Genesis, it makes everything new right now. And it's as if you've been born again when it happens. It's a regenesis as a beginning to show forth the great Palin Genesis that is coming on this very last day. To look at us and say, oh, that's what's coming at the consummation of all things. That, when I look at you guys, I smile. This is what's coming at the end. The grace of God, he saved us. I want you to see what happens at this new birth and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. And I'm running out of time. Verse 6. Uh, verse 7, actually. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so we also get the flyover that now the God of the universe now declares us not guilty. He treats us as if we live the life Jesus did and we died the death that he died. And now God looks at you and declares you not guilty. And he gives you the last point is he makes you an heir according to eternal life. And so we have this amazing promise of what's coming at the end. So do you, do you marvel at what you were in verse 3? I, I hate verse 3. That's me. I lived there. But do you marvel at verse 5? He saved us by his mercy and his love and his kindness. He appeared and he saved us by this regenesis within our own souls, making us new with the power of God now going to be changing and conforming us from one image of glory to another. We're justified and we have an amazing inheritance laid up for us. So remind them of their calling. Remind them to enter in verse 1 through 2 this world and live in a different way. Remind them of their condition, how bad off they were, but remind them of their conversion. Don't ever get over your salvation. And our last point then is remind them of their commission. This is the fruit of what should come out of such kindness and mercy and love and grace. This is the, out, this is the outworking now of the child of God. Look with me in verse 8. This, this is a trustworthy statement. You can bank on this. You can die on this. Concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, Titus. Preach it. Be bold. Don't back down. So that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. So our commission is that we enter into this world as these new creations. He saved us. And we go and engage in good deeds. We show the world what a saved man or woman or child looks like. We enter into this world. We come with the mercy and the compassion and the love of Christ. We model it. We show it forth in doing good deeds for everyone that we, God brings into our path and life and where we can help relieve needs and be good. This is what happens. He saved us. And now we are to be absorbed in the kindness and love and the grace of God. It's not based on good deeds that we have done, but on sheer mercy. Let it flow into every life possible. Let it flow into the church in Titus 2. And let it flow into the world in Titus 3. Engage in good deeds. That has been the purpose through this whole epistle. Go show them something. Go show them saved lives. Go enter into new lives and good deeds empowered by the Spirit of God. And he says, those who have believed God. I pray that's every one of us. Do you know how many people believe in God? Almost 80% of Americans say they believe in a God. Power. Few who believe God. To believe God is that He saved, put your name in there instead of us. To believe God is by His mercy and His love and His kindness and Jesus appearing, He saved Ken Murphy. That's what it means to believe God. He saved even me even my sins. We show the world a saving God by being a saved people. He saved us by regenesis with a power to show forth the beauties and the excellencies of Jesus Christ. Our lives are our platform for the evangel evangelization of our society and this world. And I think that's what's missing in the church today. And so I ask you as we close, do you know this regenesis? I'm not asking you if you're religious. Have you been born again? Do you know the regenesis? Do you know the salvation? Look at how you live in this world and its governments and its system and it will show you. 
Look at how you view what you were in Adam. And look at how you view your salvation. Is it by the free mercy of God alone? Have you repented of your sin and your righteousness? Are you engaged in good deeds? Or are you just sitting around wagging your finger at a dying society and a dead culture? Is it flowing from the same heart that was in God that just flows out of the power of God within us? May God give us this and not dead external religion. And as Jesus said, unless you're born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. I'm going to be up front afterwards. And if, you're, if you are just religious and you say, I want to be born again, I want you to come up and we'll spend time and we'll pray and we'll work through this very principle. This will change society if we be these kind of people. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beautiful words in Titus. God, I thank you for what you have revealed through this word. And we have learned beautiful things, and I thank you, God, that you have raised up uh, elders who are dedicating themselves to the preaching and teaching of this word of God and to silence false teachers. I thank you that there's a revived and renewed heart in this body right now of how to pour into one another's lives. God, that we are uh, shepherding and discipling one another and teaching each other how to live the life of God in day-to-day fashion. And I thank you that there's a group, there's a culture who's going out into this world that is perverse and it's uh, enslaved to sin. And we're going out with the eyes of Christ and the heart of Christ and the message of Christ. God, would we be the hands of Christ? Would we go and do good deeds to them? Would we share the good message, the good news, glad tidings of good news? God, would you just let our hearts be overwhelmed with the grace and the love and the mercy and the kindness that has appeared. And it wasn't based on our goodness, our righteous acts, but it was only by your sheer mercy. God, let every heart marvel at your kindness and your mercy toward them. And let that be the springboard for a life of pursuing after good things for people. God, may we do good deeds for the name of Jesus Christ. And in and through him we pray. Amen.